So it's always fun to share ideas and get some feedback on new lessons. So thank you so much for joining me for this webinar. Um, we did a few quick uh, introductions um, in the chat as we started. Does anyone else wanna, who joined us at the last minute, wanna do a quick introduction? So I'd just like to welcome all the FSW colleagues that saw my email <laughs> and joined the meeting today. <laughs> so we've got Sandra, Tatiana, and Megan, and I understand Tina Churchill was hoping to come, but she's got to go take care of the kids. So the recording is going to be good. I'm going to be sharing it with the faculty. All right. That's so wonderful. Thank you. All right. Well, my name is Carol Howald. I'm a faculty at Howard Community College in Maryland. Um, today, I'll be sharing an early lesson that allows my students to build ideas about what it means to be common and rare using standard deviations and z-score. Um, this is exactly where we are in my class, actually, so it's perfect timing. Although the lesson has a focus on describing common and rare events, um, after using this lesson the first time, I found an extra bonus as we continued on with the course. It allowed my students to experience and make sense of sampling vari variation early in my course in a really uh, salient fashion. And these experiences early in my steps course ended up laying a really useful underpinning for introducing inferential statistics concepts um, such as confidence intervals later in the course because they were just much more comfortable with this idea of sample variation and why I would need an, an interval and how that confidence might be impacted. Um, so this lesson and others are available at statprep.org. Um, so I'm gonna just flip over to that page really quickly. We've got this just statprep.org, it's the introduction information, but up here in the right-hand corner, it says for instructors, you can see class materials, some textbook companions, topic overviews. And so this lesson that we're gonna look at, I have it in uh, PowerPoint, each of the pieces, but you can also come here to get actually the lesson itself. Uh, there it is, common and rare. Um, and I just wanted to show you this page because it's got uh, lessons to that will address other um, areas as well, comparing two groups, confidence intervals and stuff. But we're going to focus on um, common and rare. This page is also where you can uh, access the little apps. And this is basically just a, an application that can allow us to access some large data sets and some visualization tools that are really helpful in analyzing them. So we're going to come back and grab a little app from there as well. And I can also put those links directly in the chat where you can get there directly. All right. All right. Back to here. So let's just talk about the learning objectives for the lesson. Um, our content objective is to build meaning to terms such as common and rare using statistical concepts. And we want to incorporate how variability within a sample distribution is really taken into consideration. Um, the important foundation topics uh, later in my course, we're going to look at sampling distributions, and I want students to understand what a common or rare sample result means in the context of a study. So this is that first place we're sort of just talking about common and rare result in the um, in, within a sim single sample, but I also want to talk about, well, when I look at a sampling distribution, what's a common or rare sample result, um, and that'll uh, apply later on. So concepts of standard deviation and z-score are pretty central to our curriculum. They're important because a person's uh, perspective of what is common and what is rare may differ based on their experience. You can't tell I'm sitting at my desk in front of the screen, but I am actually a pretty short person. I'm five foot three. So honestly, if I stand next to a six foot per six foot tall person, they are really tall to me, right? When I hang out with my family, I am just like pretty common. We're all about the same height, right? Um, but we wanna make decisions based on data and not just personal experience. So we wanna be able to define common and rare using a statistical measure like standard deviation or Z-score. Uh, and we're gonna do that by looking at some real data. And we'll start with just looking at some height data. Uh, I do want to say that in my class, when I start this lesson, I have already introduced measures of center and measures of spread. And my students would know that the standard deviation is a measure 
that um, involves the distance between data points and the mean. So I talk about it as a measure that sort of approximates the average distance from the mean for all the points in the data set. So that's really the, the background that they have coming into this lesson. Um, so when, we're, when we've introduced that, we talk about, you know, here I have a histogram. Let's look at the sample standard deviation. Let's look at, at one standard deviation, two standard deviation, three standard deviation, right? And we can talk about things like data sets where the Supreme Court has defined compelling evidence as to being either two or three standard deviations out from the mean. So just put them in context right there. What does it mean to be more than the typical amount from the mean? All right, so we want to start by just getting some personal conceptions out on the table. So no Googling or looking at your favorite site. Um, let's just share what you think is a common range for adult heights. And you can just put those in the chat. Uh, and so we'll get a collection of what, uh, what our initial perception of a common range is for adult height. The data we're going to look at is going to be in centimeters. So if you can do a quick calculation to change your range, so the endpoints are in centimeters. Uh, good question, Megan. She uh, asked, is this men, women, or all? And it's just going to be all adults. Give you a little time to do some calculation. So a 168, that sounds like a, a center, Sandra. What do you think would be a range of adults for women that anyone in that range you would call sort of the common height? Okay, so Rona's got one from 150 to 185. Tatiana said around 169. So we're getting sort of those centers around the upper 160s. Elizabeth, we got 145 to 190. And Bika, 155 to 177. So again, that's sort of nice. Those are some various ranges just based on our personal experience, right? And we want to get an idea of, well, does that really capture the typical group of people, right? So we're going to use um, some data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study, uh, which is conducted by the National Center for Health Statistics here in Maryland. Um, and we're going to access it using one of the little uh, apps developed by Danny Kaplan as part of our stat prep project. Um, before I put in the link to the app itself, uh, I just want to share a slide that introduces the app so that we're all sort of knowing what we're getting into while well, I still have your attention and you're just not wildly playing with data, okay? So for all of the little um, apps uh, developed by Danny, they all had the same format. This is the app we're going into, and it's called the Density app, but they're all gonna have a, four tabs at the top here. And so this first tab, it's blue because it's active and it says data. And that's just the page or the um, tab that's allowing me to choose a data set and a variable of interest. We're going to look at the NHANES or the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study data set, and we're going to look at adult height. Okay. When I choose that, it gives me a little preview of a density graph. So a density graph is just a smooth histogram where the area under that curve is one. Um, and these little points tell me, okay, I have a default of 50 people in my sample, and I've got 50 depths down there. And if I built a histogram and smoothed it, that's what the histogram would look like, okay? So in addition to the data tab, if I click on the graph tab, it's just gonna take this graph and make it large. So I have a, a, a bigger visual, and it also allows me to use different tools. For each of the different apps, we have different types of visualization tools uh, and different things that we can um, manipulate within the graph. So that's what the graph tab always does. The compare tab allows me to freeze a sample. So that's that little snowflake. So let's say I have the sample of 50. 
when you pull up this tool, you're going to get some other random sample, right? That's the beauty of sampling, right? We're all going to get a different sample. And we can hit the compare button after we've frozen one and look at lots of different samples right next to it. When I teach this in the classroom, they all have their computers. So they're looking over at each other's shoulders to compare samples to see that they're all getting different samples. But it's a definitely a powerful way for me to display it on the screen as a teacher. And even as a student, they're sort of, they sort of also like to have that frozen one that I can compare against as well. Okay. And then the fourth tab is always the stats. And what stats are shared depends upon the application you're in. So because we have a one variable uh, that we're going to look at at a time, we'll be able to um, see what the mean is, for example, and also uh, the range that we're looking at for common and rare. All right. So all six apps have those. We can always change the sample size, and this is really great for students. We, in my class, we've already done some different sample sizes to see that the patterns really change. If I only take a sample of 10, then we get really wide results, right? Because 10 doesn't give me a really good picture of the whole population. Um, so I can change that. I can hit this to the dice to get a new sample, the freeze I mentioned. The three lines are more options, and what's in there really varies by what app it is. We'll dive into the more options in a little bit. Um, the other important button that I actually use a lot in my class is the code book, right? So I've already told you we're going to use the NHANES data set for this first example, and we're going to look at adult heights. But you might be going, hmm, what, how did they define adult height? Who is that? Is that 16 and older? Is that 18 and older? Is that 21 or older? So the code book basically gives me a little information about the data set and a little information about each variable available in there. All right, so those are the key tools that we're gonna use. All right, so let's actually flip over and look at the uh, app. Um, we can, let's see, Grace, do you have the link to the app or shall I cut and paste? Um, um, if you give me a second, I can get it. Okay, I was gonna just go to the stat prep and you can always choose the little apps and then choose the app you're interested in. Uh, oops, there it is. I should have warned you about this in advance. Cool. So she's taking you to the little app site and then you just wanna look at the points and density app. You can also just follow along on my screen as we go either way. When you open it, you will always get that introduction part. And it just goes through those four top links and then the buttons and switches as before. If I click on anywhere on the graph, that'll go away and I'll be back on my data tab. So again, data is blue, I'm on my data tab. Um, the source package, uh, Danny actually built in a couple different packages in the little apps, um, that's always there. The NHANES data is one of them. But depending on what text, there's a chance that we actually have uploaded in here the data sets that accompany your textbook. So if you use open intro as your stats text, all the data sets that they refer to in that book have been loaded into this app as well. Same for our stats using technology, uh, Lock5, Triola, Sullivan. You can also upload your favorite data set. Wow. We're going to stay in Little App. We're going to choose the NHANES data frame. There are also um, um, the natality data, and we're going to look at that in the next example. We're interested in heights. So when I click on that drop down menu, I can see all the different variables in here. Adult heights is way down here at the bottom. And so I'm going to just click on that. And it gives me a little preview. All right. Again, I just want a bigger picture. I want to be able to manipulate that graph some. So I'm going to go back out to graph. Right. So what's this graph showing me? I have 50 samples, so there's 50 black dots in here. And if I put that in a histogram, it would give me a shape approximately like this. It's been smoothed out. I don't have the jagged edges of a histogram. I know if I change the sample space, 
right? Up to some point, I might get a little bit more representative. Does everyone's graph look just like mine? Probably not. So if I wanted to compare, I can hit freeze here and go to compare, right? That's the graph I just had. If I do the dice, I can see here's another sample of 100. For my students, these look like incredibly different graphs to them, right? They see this giant bump and this other bump. And what we're trying to say and help them understand is that there are some features that seem to change with every sample, but there are some things that seem to trend and stay the same. And so that's really what we're going to look at. Let's take one of the um, ranges that someone gave in the chat. So if I scroll back up, um, let's see, we had um, the first range we had was the 150 to 185. Let's actually manipulate this and set up these boundaries to get that range and see what percentage of people are in that 150 to 185. So the tools tied to this graph, I'm gonna hit back to my big graph. The middle one is the mean and it is anchored. I can't pick that up. It's right here at a Z score of zero, it's the mean. But if I wanna set up this range, right? It's initially at one standard deviation. In my class, I've talked about that if I'm within one standard deviation, that's a pretty uh, standard result, result. So I'm just hovering my mouse over that. And up here at the top, it's telling me how many standard deviations. So I call that typical. Within two standard deviations, it's common. So I'm gonna move this out and say, what did I say we were gonna take, 185? 185 looks like to be about right here, right? And I'm gonna move this one way out of the way, right? Here's 180, 190, 185, maybe move it a little bit over. And then on the lower side, she had 150. So here would be 150. So for Rona's definition of what a common range of heights for adults was, when I set up that range, I can see that her range captures 80 or 45.7 plus 43.7. So what is that? 88, 89.5%, almost 90% of the people, right? So this is where that sample variation is helpful. Even if I change it, 89, about 90% again. The graph changed shapes, but I still caught about 90% of the population. I did it again, 87, 88% this time. So still pretty close. So Rona's uh, initial guess of what a typical common height was seems to be over multiple different random samples to be capturing about 90% of the population. So even though the shape changed, there was this consistent feature um, in there. So Megan asked, is there a way to assign values to the bars with numbers instead of dragging them? At this point, there's not. It's a dragging tool. So it's, it's very uh, tactile for my students, right? Um, we could have done that with any range. So typically in my class, they're working in small groups and I'll have them do their different uh, samples on the board, and then they'll sort of see that over multiple samples that even if they chose a different range, like if we now did 165 to 175 was the range that Megan did, I'm going to change those bars. She's not going to capture 90%, but whatever percent she captures, it's going to be consistent over various samples. So if I go to 65, oops. 165, so I'm taking Megan's, that's about right there. And she had said to 175, about right there. And so she captures, what, 
by 36%. And again, if I do another sample, 31-ish percent. So in the mid 30s for her percent. So her range of what she thought was common is much more narrow, but notice that it's still consistent over multiple samples. Okay. So I want to, I basically spend some talking about the group that they each had their own perspective of what they thought there was common and that we need to decide as a community, how do we want to decide what common is? Maybe we want to decide common to be to capture the middle 90%. And then Rona gave us a pretty good guess, right? If I have a class where they're all sort of all over the map, I'll try to choose something different. Like let's capture the middle 75%, right? So then I might say, well, how do I need to adjust this? If I want to capture the middle 75, how much do I want to leave out here? Right, so if I capture 75 in the middle, I'd have about 12 and a half percent on each side. So I could move this out oops, until I get about 12 and a half percent. So again, we can as a class decide, let me move this one out of the way, what we want the middle percentage to be. Right, so here I've got about 75% in the middle. And I can see that that range is about from 156 maybe to 181. And then that should stay pretty consistent over multiple samples. Cool. So in the chat, um, and Bika mentioned, we could also get those stats. Right now, these percentages in colors tie to the smoothed density curve in here. If I wanna say for my particular random sample, what percentages were in there, the stats that I go to say that in this particular curve, zero, because I pull those way ends the way out to the outside, I don't have anyone in the rare zone, but I have 11% um, uh, from 139 to 1156, 42%. Um, so in this one is based on the actual data set, uh, the sample, uh, while the percentages that I see on the graph, they're a little bit different um, because it's based on the smooth histogram, okay? And I'll be honest, when I'm first introducing this and just trying to get sort of a feeling for, oh, even though our graph shapes look different, but I'm capturing the same percentage in there, I try to focus just on one or the other. And of course, the visual one's sort of really powerful for them um, because then I have to sort of sort through what this, curve, this um, smoothing looks like. We only looked at common, but again, we could talk about rare. If I ask you to share, what did you think a rare height would be uh, for an adult population? Um, you know, for me, I, earlier I had said something like six, if I'm standing next to a six foot person, that's pretty, uh, seems pretty tall to me. Excuse me, so a six foot person, oh my goodness, I have to do that math, don't I? 72 times 2.54, right? About 183. If I wanted that to be my definition of rare, right? I could see that, oh, it's really not that rare. That's 7.6% of the population. Um, so again, from my perspective, my six foot person, that's really 7.6% of the population. So maybe that's really not rare, right? So if, again, if I wanted to set a rare, I might say, well, that's, I want that to be the top 1%. So then I could say, what, where do I wanna move this? So that my rare event only comes up 1% of the time. And it looks like if I get up to about 189 centimeters, that's maybe really rare. So again, I can sort of take my personal perspective and say, oh, within the data, my conception of rare, a rare height isn't very accurate. And now the data sort of tells me a, a better idea of what's rare. 
Questions about height or any aspects of the tool that came up as you were playing? All right, then let's go back and investigate another variable and just get some practice moving through the tools. So let me head back here. Let's look at um, thinking about the age of mother at birth. And again, so this is always fun in my community college classes because I will have a huge range of ages. I'll have, I've got some six, my youngest student this semester is 16 and I have somebody in their 50s um, as well. So I've got a huge range of uh, students in age and a fair number of them are mothers. We get a lot of health science. So it turns out I have a lot of females in my stats class. So this ends up to be an interesting one. But you can look through the data sets uh, in um, the app and you can choose what you think the students would be interested in. So this one is just based on this. So we're gonna go to um, the app again and we're gonna look at the natality data set for 2014 just to get some experience moving between data sets. And we're gonna look at the um, variable M-A-G-E-R. I actually defined it here but we're gonna also say, well, where could I find that in the uh, little app to clarify what did Megger stand for? Stands for the age of a mother when she gave birth. And we're gonna check and say, well, what's the common range of age of mother at birth? So we wanna capture, drag the bars so that there's 10% to the left and 10% the right. So we're defining common as the middle 80%. Right, we, we're just gonna decide that that's how we're gonna define common. So I'm gonna go back to the little app. I'm no longer interested in height. So I'm gonna go back to my data tab. So up on the upper left-hand corner, I, once I get familiar with these data sets and I can decide which one has interesting things for me, but I'm gonna go to the utility. And its default one said me route, which I don't even know what it is, but it's telling me that's a categorical variable. So this is silly to draw a density plot. So it's sort of a nice way to say. So instead I wanna go in there and find my M-A-G-E-R variable. So there it is, Megar. Okay. If I didn't know what that stood for, if you're just exploring on your own and there's lots of weird looking variable names in there, just remember, it looks like a little detective there with a hat on, it says show code book. So if I click on that, one, it tells me a little bit about the natality data. It's put together by the Center for Disease Control. Um, it's the full set of births, keeping a subset of variables for that tie to potential risk factors and outcomes. Uh, in this data set, it only has a random sample of about 10,000 though larger data sets are available if you wanted to load them. So as I scroll down, I can see here's my MAGR, mother's age at date of birth, right? That me route that came up earlier that I didn't know what it was, right? I could scroll down till I could find this. Um, I say I could find it, M rupt, ruptured uterus, whether that happened. So that was a categorical variable, yes or no, did that happen? Okay, so again, once I'm done looking around in the documentation, I can just click off anything and it'll go out. Here's my preview. It stayed with my default of a sample size of 100. Feel free to play with that sample size. And let's just look at the big graph. So again, if you've got it on your, sc your screen, our goal is to try to get the common bound to have 10% um, on each side. So here's my mean in the middle. I'm going to try to get this to have 10% total. So there's 3% and 7%. I've got just over 10% on the right. There's, I've got my 10% total. Okay, 9.9, .9, so that's pretty close, right? So it looks like the average rate, our average age, sorry, is between, this was 35, maybe 37 and 19, so 19 to 37. My guess is you all have some different answers. Did somebody get something other than 19 to 37? You can feel free to put them in the chat or you can um, just 
to speak up. 19 to 38 from Megan, pretty similar. So again, in a large class, I'd have my students just be reporting this out on the board as, after they had recovered them. And we're gonna see that even though they have different random samples, right? That's what would happen in a real study. Uh, researchers gonna grab a single random sample. They're hoping it's representative of the whole population, but they know that's not the only sample they can grab. So across our classroom, they'll see all the different samples Right, and maybe on the screen they look a little different. Right, maybe yours looks like something like this, but if it's still capturing fairly consistently that ten percent, right? So for this one, I'm going to have to move this a little bit. So I'm gonna get from 35 to about 19. So it's not perfect, but I'm gonna get that trend. And that's really what we talk about, that over the various samples, we're gonna see a common trend that it's in that 19 to upper 30s range, right? So we're really getting a feeling for, even though we've got many different samples, there's a variability across samples, but I can still see a trend for the population, okay? So again, we could tie this back to our standard deviations. We defined it as the middle 80% for common. And we can see that that goes between 1.4 standard deviation and down to, mine does not seem to be active. Oh, there it went, negative 1.4. So, a little more than, or a little short of a standard deviation and a half from the mean. So again, I'm trying to tie in that language of standard deviation and z-score as well. So we were used to looking at one standard deviation. Now I can see that I'm about just under one and a half standard deviation out. Questions so far? I wanted to again go to the stats. I can see that the true mean in here was a mean of 27.8 for the sample. Um, this frozen one is from the height one, but I can't undo the frozen one. I'd have to freeze a new one. So if I go back to graph and I froze this one, then at least I have um, mother's age tied in here, that 27.8. And this is the actual sample data, how many counts I were, was in there to get that. And again, the, they don't quite agree. This is, uh, if I look at those middle uh, ones, um, right, that ties to where the black dots are. Right? So how many are actually in there? As opposed to the numbers on these for this page, that ties to the smooth density curve. Right. And my students always come up because they're like, oh, I go to stats, I don't get the same percentage. And that's what's happening. So let's go back to here. So we can both get the boundary amount, and then we can also talk about the z-score and how many standard deviations that is. All right. We, in addition to just working with these tools of variables, we choose, we want students to pose and investigate good questions as well. So I sort of posed all the questions for you over the past, um, but we really wanna also have them. So I asked my class to choose a source package. So maybe they wanna stay in the enhanced data. Uh, I have a lot of health science students. They're quite fascinated with the birth data. So some of them will stay in there. Um, I tell them they can actually ex explore any of those in there. This might be a good time for you that if your textbook is listed under the source package to go in there and peek uh, and see what all is available and just choose a data set and a variable to consider and think about what would be a good question to pose about that data. Uh, so for my example, um, I uh, said, you know, my 
doctor for some reason is interested in my blood pressure, right? Uh, and I've been told repeatedly that if it goes over 130 for the systaltic uh, number, uh, that's a concern to my doctor and should be a concern to me. So I might be curious, right? What fraction of people in this study had a systaltic pressure above 130? Um, and is that really an uncommon event? Uh, you know, when the doctor says it's something to be concerned about, I was sort of wondering, well, does that mean it's rare? Is my blood pressure that unusual? Um, is it more than two standard deviations above the mean, right? So I can define it as uncommon. I can define it as two standard deviations above the mean. I might have asked, is that a rare event? Is it above three standard deviations of the mean? So that'd be a question I could investigate using these tools, right? So I would have to go find this variable in the NHANES data set and answer it. So I'm gonna just give you a little time to explore because I also find that that's a good time for, to find out if there's any questions that then come up about the tools. But take a few minutes, peek at some of the different data sets um, that are in there. Or if you wanna stick with um, say the NHANES data, there's lots of fun variables in there um, that you might wanna explore, try to, Pick, of course, a quantitative variable uh, and see what kind of questions you come up with, right? Uh, if you find a good one that you think might be worth sharing so that people have other examples they can do with their class, let's just put them in the chat, what variable you're interested in, right? Um, what might be the question that you're going to investigate? And as you're exploring, if you have questions, let's just chat about them, all right?
I investigated my question a little bit and just put a summary in the chat. Um, I found out that 130 is just one standard deviation above the mean, so not all that uncommon. So that doesn't mean my doctor shouldn't be worried. It just means a lot of us maybe have high blood pressure, right? So that was sort of interesting for me to find out that, you know, I'm in the same boat as many people. It's not an uncommon event. To get three standard deviations above the mean, I'd have to hit 160 in my blood pressure, which would be a, considered a pretty rare event. Did anyone come up with a really cool question for us to investigate? All right, we've got Ambika who wrote in, I wanted to investigate mental health. So she looked at mental health bad days in the past 30 days. And I believe that's in the NHANES data set. Um, and she saw three to 11% or even higher saying 30 days were not good on their mental health. Um, it's not as rare as I thought it would be that all 30 days are bad um, for folks' mental health. Yeah, so again, I think that's a real interesting one. If you haven't had a lot of interaction um, with mental health care, you may not realize what is it to be unusual or even high. That's an excellent one. Thank you. Other variables people found interesting? I love doing this activity with my students uh, it, and because I do it fairly early in the semester, it also tells me what are some areas of interest to them, what holds their attention. So as I go forward in the class, I try to come back to some of those where we look at those data sets from a different perspective. Uh, with some of the other um, little apps, you could say compare mental health between men and women. So I can take that area that they found interesting uh, to, to build on to the, for some other topics in the class. Zambika said she kept randomizing to see what kind of numbers I getting. Did it stay like a pretty uh, steady trend or was there a lot of variation uh, for your sample? Okay, over 5% on average. Yeah, I'd say over 5% on average, but definitely was like three to 11% or 13%. So um, not as rare, you know, as I thought it would be, which is under five, there was definitely some under five, but I was surprised at how many said all 30 days in the past 30 days was a struggle with mental health, you know? Yeah. Do, can I, do you mind sharing, Ambika, what size sample were you looking at? Uh, Cause that helps me. Um, 100. Okay, good. So that helps me sort of see at a hundred um, she could narrow it down in a range, um, but she was still saying, you said something like three to 11%. Okay, cool. Let's see, Rona says, I'm checking the available data sources. The Sullivan text doesn't provide a whole lot of data. Many of our staff students are in healthcare and Haynes and Natalie might be of more interest. And that's what's so nice. There's some that are just built in. So even if your text doesn't have those, as you get familiar with those data sets, it's a, it's a wonderful resource. But of course, if you have some of your own favorite data sets, you can upload them. So it's not like you have to just leave behind some of your favorite data sets. Um, oh, good. So Tatiana investigated some pulse. And so uh, did you just happen to take your pulse right now? Yeah, so that's very cool. That's one where students would have easy access in class to sort of see where they fell in. They could even, um, you can sort of do some backwards work here and figure out what uh, the mean and standard deviation is um, and then find their z-score to say where would their pulse fall within that. Uh, so that's, that's a great idea and a great one, Tatiana. Very cool. 
All right, so a ton of potential and you can sort of see uh, where you can take this uh, forward from here. Just coming back, um, I did wanna say that when I work with this uh, in my classes, I just popped up on the screen. I typically don't have PowerPoints in classes because I want students to be able to share their screens and in our classrooms, they can project from their computer up. Um, so I often give them the activity sheet that's available on the website, uh, on the stat prep website. So this is the activity the students are following through. So it does the same thing. They talk about what's a common height, um, grab a tab, we investigate data. Um, and then the last activity for the day is for them to consider their own. So again, this is available. You can download it so you can personalize it if you found other data sets that are more interesting. So instead of doing mother's age at birth, maybe you have some other favorite one. Um, but at least that template's available for a lesson and you could share it with your students there. Okay. So just a little recap. Um, so the intervals that I use within one standard deviation, I refer to my students as typical results. Within two standard deviations, I tend to call it common, and that's helping building some foundation when we look at the empirical rule. Um, for two standard deviations, I wanna capture 95% uh, of the data if it's a normal distribution. Um, rare, I talk about being beyond three standard deviations. Our text also talks about it as an extreme outlier, right? And that space in between two and three we refer to as an uncommon, um, but not rare event. So maybe we might call it an outlier, but it's not an extreme outlier. Um, and then the important things, hopefully, that they're finding as they go through and resample over and over again and look for some trends, right? We want to know if patterns observed when they're consistent from sample to sample. So that's that resample idea. And we also want to see how they present over alternate sample sizes, right? If I only get variation when I change from a sample of five to a sample of 100, um, then it's telling us a sample of five is probably too small to really take into. But once I get up there into 50, 100, 200, I should see some patterns across there, right? That we can talk about trends. So if that's true, then we have strong, strong position, uh, suspicions that we're observing an actual trait of the population rather than a random feature of a single sample. And um, then we can talk about um, sampling error, right? We can get a trend or a range, but every once in a while, some strange one might pop up that's uh, an, un uh, uh, an unrepresentative sample that just showed up by random sampling. Right. Questions or comments from uh, any of you? Can you see other things you might investigate using our points and density app? For my class, the, when we looked at uh, the common and rare event, they had already used this app in one other place. When we first started looking at histograms and we were talking about skew and symmetric, um, I had them uh, just read the definition of some of the variables and decide before looking at a graph, did they think it would turn out skewed or did they think that would be a, a representative symmetric representation. And so that was really interesting. It just helped them get comfortable with this idea of, you know, is there a floor where it could only skew in one direction? Um, was it, un, you know, would I expect that we'd have a few people with low ones, but a more spread out one? There are variables like income, uh, age, the first time you tried marijuana, those were ones where that they were able to predict pretty consistently what way the skews were and stuff. So it was sort of just a, another way to use this tool. So this lesson that I shared is one way to use that points and density, but I think once you get comfortable with the tool, there's wonderful things that you can explore with these. All right, well, that is all I have for you today, but 
please feel free to stay around and ask any questions or play with the app a little bit. Um, but thanks for coming and uh, exploring the site, right? And don't forget, you can go to statprep.org, look for some other lessons available and explore the other five apps if you're interested in.